Welcome back, everyone. I hope you've had a good lunch, some coffee to keep us going through the day. And it's a particular pleasure to welcome onto the stage Christian Levitt. Um, Chris was doing modern classicisms long before it became vogue, whether in academic circles or in museological ones. And in fact, the whole project of what we're trying to do with modern classicisms, or the dialogue between classical and contemporary art, is really fundamental to what Chris set up at the Museum of Classical Art at Mugin. And that's why I think such a wonderful partnership for us at King's to be working closely with the Museum at Mugin. And we also have, thanks uh, to the EU, in fact, thanks uh, to the Erasmus Plus programme, we also have here at King's uh, exchange system whereby two students each year can spend two months um, on a special internship in Mugin working with Lisa Pauli and Benet Montan. So Chris, I thought we could begin by asking you where your idea for juxtaposing classical and contemporary art comes from. Um, sure. I mean, first of all, um, I'm a sort of fanatical collector of, of all sorts of things, really, from artworks from different periods to, um, to coins, um, arms and armor and weaponry. And um, so I started off sort of collecting coins and first and second World War campaign medals as a child. And then into my 20s, I got into collecting, like I say, Greek and Roman coins and all these various other things, even hand-painted natural history books, 18th and 19th century ones. Um, and then I sort of discovered the antiquities market. And I've been buying various artworks to sort of decorate my house here in London, and then a house that I bought in, in Mugin, near Cannes, in the south of France. And um, along the way, uh, uh, sort of buying a handful of antiquities, I'd come across um, several artworks that I thought would make nice juxtapositions within the house alongside the antiquities. So uh, one of which was a drawing, for example, of, of Caracalla by Matisse, an early drawing by Matisse, and I, I'd already bought a bust of, uh, of Caracalla, uh, for, ex for, uh, for example. Um, and then I started to see other sort of artworks along the way as my antiquities collection sort of built out. And then I became so sort of fanatical with, <laughs> with collecting antiquities that I was buying significantly more than would ever be sort of displayable at home. And, um, and they started mounting up in various, various storage facilities in, in London and New York and, um, and in France. And um, so it got to the point where I'd accumulated this, this collection and the only thing left to do with it was to sort of put it on public display. And it then struck me that it actually might be a good idea also to to continue collecting artworks that had classical themes um, as that sort of worked as such a nice juxtaposition and that there was clearly so many artists in the, you know, from the Baroque period through to the sort of 20th and 21st century that had, had classical periods and that actually might make a really um, sort of nice theme for the museum as it were and um, because then it would make that crossover between as we sort of discussed you know, many times this morning, between art in the ancient world and art, art in the mod modern world and, and really demonstrate that, that uh, sort of kind of connection between, between both, uh, both time periods. And, um, and from a public interest perspective, that would also in sort of make the museum relatively unique as an individual museum in its own right. And also from a, a more sort of um, footfall perspective, just appeal to people, you know, right across the board, whether they were interested in Greek and Roman and uh, Egyptian antiquities, or whether they were interested in seeing uh, a, a Christopher Le Brun or a Mark Quinn or a Damien Hirst. So, uh, so it sort of covers all all areas, really. And why why Mugin? So we heard a little bit before from from Nick Hornby talking about Matisse and Picasso, but is Mugin a particularly loaded place for? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I bought a house in, in, in Mugin um, about 15 years ago, um, having already lived in the south of France for five years before that. And 
uh, I love Yu Jiang for, for several reasons. First of all, it has a sort of great culinary uh, history. Um, and Ducasse started his career in Mujan, for, for example, at a, at a restaurant um, under Roger, Roger Verger, who's one of the top sort of chefs in the world in the sort of 70s and 80s. But also, the, it has an absolutely incredible art history. Um, Picasso spent the last 13 years of his life living in, in Mujan and died there. Uh, Leger had a studio in Mujan. Um, Francis Picabia lived in Mujan. Jean Cocteau lived in Mujan. Uh, Man Ray lived in Mujan, so, um, and people like Marc Chagall have visited Picasso at his house in, in Mujan. So it had this incredible 20th century art history to it as well. So after I'd come to the decision to actually get all these antiquities out of storage and some of the artworks out of storage and continue to build that collection, actually put them on public display, there was really only two places to do it. One was to do it maybe in London, um, and the other place to do it was maybe where it would be a lot more sort of unique and stand out a lot more, and that was to do it in Mujan, kind of the home of, one of the homes of 20th century art. So, so I went for that. One of the things that you do with your displays in Mujan are these unexpected juxtapositions. So we look at a, uh, a sea of ancient portrait busts, for example, and then in their midst we see a Mark Quinn piece. Um, there's something very playful here, I think, about um, an almost sort of time travel in some way, that within the space of these galleries, the bridge, the, the distance between antiquity and modernity is, is bridged um, through, through careful juxtapositions. Uh, well, that's, that's absolutely, so I'm just conscious that the microphone was too far away in the first session. Um, I mean, that's absolutely correct. And um, it really is extraordinary when you, when you sort of uh, you, you know, look at any period of, of art from sort of the Renaissance onwards, from Lucas Cranach and his studio in 1500 painting pictures of Lucretia to, to Rubens painting the 12 emperors, you know, 100 years later, then 100 years later after that, you know, Delacroix, as Christopher Lebrun mentioned earlier, and then 130 years after that, you get into sort of Picasso's uh, classical period with his Ballard, Ballard suite in the 1930s, and he was still painting classical pictures in the, in the 1940s. Um, and, uh, and here we are in the 21st century, and uh, we heard Mark obviously talk a lot about his sculptures of, um, uh, of, of people with challenges, and Alison Lapper, of course, uh, the fourth plinth piece, uh, being the most famous uh, among them. But this one here is by Mark, and uh, this is a chap called Bill Waters, uh, the piece is called Blind Since Birth. And, um, and Mark produced this years before I had any idea of doing the museum, sort of, uh, sort of eight or nine years ago. And um, he'd put it on a Roman plinth, plinth and uh, Bill Waters here has, uh, has a sort of Julio-Claudian sort of square haircut. And uh, of course, it looks absolutely fantastic in amongst the, you know, the original Roman bus. So, uh, and against the dark blue as well. I mean, using colour, some of the ways we talked about earlier on as well. Yeah, that's right. We've tried to use sort of Roman colours, actually, the, sort of the deep sort of red burgundy and, uh, and, uh, and the blue as well. Uh, this is one of the upstairs galleries and um, where you can see a sort of range of sculpture from uh, Rodin in the middle to various uh, sort of Roman sculptures. Um, this one actually is quite an interesting piece uh, in the front. It's the Crow Hall Urn, which um, was found in a Christie's sort of house sale of Crow Hall in Bath uh, about eight or nine years ago. And um, actually someone had uh, uh, drilled a hole through the bottom and a hole through the top and put an orange lampshade on the top in the 1970s and turned it into an electric, uh, an electric lamp. And when Christie's sort of um, went through the house for the house sale, I guess, you know, sort of eight or nine years ago, someone spotted that actually that shouldn't be a 1970s electric lamp, and in fact that electrified a, a really important Roman vase that actually Piranese in the late 18th century had, had done an etching of, so it's had this incredible provenance. Yeah. Again, you know, art related as well with Piranese etching it, and um, so that was, a, that was an interesting piece. Um, and then uh, there's a sort of chalk picture of Persephone on the top sort of uh, left-hand side uh, by Brach. 
Um, and then there's a lino cut, a sort of Herculean lino cut on the left by, uh, by Picasso. Um, and then actually if you move forward a little bit, um, this cabinet here, which was in the background of that photograph, um, in the foreground you've got a 2,000 year old Roman statue of, of Aphrodite, um, so original Roman piece, um, and various other smaller Roman statues of Aphrodite, two small ones in marble and one in, in bronze. And then on the far left, you've got Eve Klein's 1962 statue of Aphrodite. Uh, Warhol's Botticelli's Venus in the background. And then on the right-hand side, you've got Aphrodite as a giraffe um, by, <laughs> by Salvador Dali. And actually, in that cabinet now, this is an older photograph, we also have a drawing of the Venus de Milo by Cezanne as well. So that's kind of the Aphrodite stroke, stroke Venus cabinet. So um, that of, is one of the key cabinets, really, in the museum that sort of tells the story of how the classical period has, has influenced artists in, in the 20th century. Yeah. It's the hers that accompanies the uh, display cabinet outside. And that blue Venus is one of the pieces we're hoping to borrow from you for the exhibition in the spring, which Christian has um, very um, kindly supported um, with many loans from the Muzak collection. So there will be a chance to see some of these pieces here in London from the 2nd of March onwards. Um, I wanted to ask you um, about this particular display, because here we are with uh, the history of Greek vase painting. And it was said before that Grayson Perry was more Baroque than classical. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Christian, about that particular vase by Grayson Perry. Is it 1988 or 86? Yeah, in fact, I only bought that last year, actually. It's a 1988 uh, Grayson Perry vase, so it must have been one of his, his sort of early commercial, earliest commercial pieces, actually, uh, um, from, I guess, not long after he'd left, um, he'd left uh, art college. And uh, interestingly, it says on the front of it, um, he's written on the front of it, a classical compromise. <laughs> So uh, it is, uh, not only does it look quite at home amongst the, the sort of the classical pieces, it's, it literally says it's a classical piece written on it. So, so um, once I saw that, I'd actually bought it at the Masterpiece Art Fair last year. And um, I just thought, you know, it was absolutely perfect for that cabinet. Um, but then we've, in the, I mean, who would have thought that Keith Herring would have, would have done anything classical? But, uh, the vase in the foreground there on the left is by Keith Herring, and actually he did a series of uh, uh, sort of black figure terracotta vases um, with, a, with a Greek theme in mind. And we're not sort of just making that up. Actually, he was interviewed about these vases when he did them, and he, he said that he'd been looking at, at sort of uh, ancient Greek vases at the time. So, um, and then also in the cabinet at the top, we've got... Um, uh, Fontana in, uh, in terracotta, which isn't maybe, I mean, zero movement is not really about the classical period, but the fact that it's in terracotta just made me think, actually, that'd be a really good juxtaposition as well. And going in, a, in, in that cabinet, I just thought would, um, you know, would be quite fun. It always makes me, when I saw it, uh, made me think of a cycladic figurine with that slit being like the nose of a cycladic figurine. So it sort of works in lots of different levels at once. Mm. But of course, Christian, one of your greatest passions, um, and especially well represented at Mujahid's armor, um, helmets, cuirasses, greaves. Mm. Um, what took you to armor specifically as something of interest? Um, well, I've always been interested in reading about sort of ancient battles and, and sort of the bloodthirstiness of, of that, I've always sort of found fascinating. So, um, and as a child, I made sort of model airplanes and collected First and Second World War medals and I had a number of family members in the army over the years and we have medal collections from that. My dad was in the army for 11 years and um, I had a fort in Malaya in the 50s. And, and um, I don't know, I guess maybe also the, the curriculum at school then was quite battle orientated, uh, at least it was when I was at school. And um, so I was then always fascinated about sort of reading and watching documentaries about ancient battles or really anything from the sort of, not so much the First and Second World War actually, but from sort of the Hundred Years War and the medieval period, sort of going back to the Crusades and then going back to sort of ancient Roman Greece. And um, so in my twenties I started buying uh, Cromwellian uh, helmets and breastplates and backplates and swords. And um, 
And then I started buying some medieval pieces. It's very difficult to buy medieval and, and Renaissance armor. It's almost impossible, anything of, of any quality. But, um, but you can buy some really interesting medieval shields, crossbows, maces, um, and, uh, and swords, and that kind of thing. And then, as I discovered the antiquities market, um, a huge collection of ancient armor was being liquidated by a family in Germany. So there's a chap called um, Axel Gutmann who had been collecting ancient armor from the late 1970s to the year 2001 when he died. So he basically put together a, a near 30 year collection of, of ancient armor and had bought pretty much everything that had been in the market throughout that entire period. Um, and then when he died in 2001, his family clearly didn't want the collection and then spent 10 years basically liquidating it through a, an array of different auction houses and, and, and dealers. And um, I thought it would, I thought not only was it an absolutely spectacular collection, but I thought it would be a really important thing to do to try and keep the bulk of it together. So for about six, seven years I spent <laughs> I spent enormous amounts of time trying to buy each piece as it came up on the market, but certainly most of the notable pieces as they were coming through auction houses in the UK and the US and Germany and through different dealers. And, um, and I got the bulk of it together and, um, and it's displayed on one of the four floors in the museum. So, and then I've added helmets to it as well that I've bought odd ones that have come into the market in the last kind of 15 years. But um, certainly, um, probably 60 or 70% of the collection was originally put together by Axel Goodman. Mm -hmm. So that was a tremendously exciting thing for me and it was also a nice thing to do from a historical and antiquity perspective as well to keep that collection together. And you founded the museum in 2011? Yeah, I mean the idea came for it in about 2008, 2009 and then it took about two years to to get the building right and get everything in it and lay down. And uh, yes, yeah, so the whole process was two, about two, two and a half years. So, and then it opened in May 2011, yeah. So uh, we're six and a half years in now. And um, how do you think the running of the museum has changed in those six and a half years? So what's the museum doing now that, uh, you know, that you're doing lots of loans, for example, I think? Yeah, I think possibly the biggest success of the museum, um, and we get a bit less than 20,000 visitors a year, and we're, we're open every single day of the year except Christmas Day. But the, the greatest success of it was really twofold. One is that we've got a lot of international notoriety on design and content of the museum, and we, when we opened in 2011, Apollo magazine, magazine gave us the, the new Museum of the Year opening award that year out of 11 different muse museums that opened around the world and galleries that year. Uh, we were nominated for um, European Museum of the Year in 2013, the only uh, museum in France that was nominated that year. We didn't win it, but to get a nomination is something, you know, pretty, pretty good. Um, so that's, that's all great, but really sort of as a collector, the thing um, that the, the is that makes you the most happy, I think, is when a museum comes to you and says, actually, we're holding this exhibition. There's something in your museum, in your collection, that actually would fit in the exhibition really well. So that sort of tells you that, actually, as a collector, you're, you're doing something right. You know, you're not buying things that just, um, you, you know, that are only interesting to you, which, which is fantastic in itself. I mean, that's really what collecting is about. But, but um, but it makes you really, you know, tremendously excited and really feel that the, the, that's a, the quality of your collection must be doing something right if other museums around the world are, are asking you for pieces. So this year we've, we've organized a record amount of loans from the museum. Uh, so we've got, uh, we've currently got two Cezanne drawings, uh, one of the Venus de Milo, uh, and one of a sort of a classical figure that are on loan to an exhibition in um, Marseille in Switzerland. We've got two Modigliani drawings of Caryatids um, that are on loan at the moment to the Jewish Museum in New York. We've got a, a Roman cavalry helmet and a Roman shield boss, boss going to the Getty. Uh, they're going on display there next March. Uh, we've got two helmets going to the Met, uh, which go on display in their arms and armor galleries next year. 
We loaned five helmets to the Hadrian's Wall exhibition, which ran from April to September this year um, along the museums along Hadrian's Wall. Uh, we've actually just taken back a Roman marble pan panel that was at the Tully House Museum for five years. Then we loaned a Greek helmet um, and one or two other things to an exhibition in, in Nice this year. Uh, and then a museum in Marseille had an exhibition of, um, of sort of Roman vessels that were used for eating and drinking, sort of a banqueting exhibition. And we loaned about five pieces to that. Uh, the, absolute, the absolute shocker to us was actually a museum in San Paolo asked us for a painting by Toulouse-Lautrec. I mean, we had no idea that anyone in Brazil even knew we existed. Um, but we had this um, sort of classical figure of, uh, of a lady, um, or oh, it looks classical, it's actually a kind of 19th century painting of a lady, but it's got a kind of classical pose to it. And um, they must have seen it online on our website or something like that, and uh, so that's been in Sao Paulo now for the last, uh, the last few months. So, so it's been an extraordinary, I mean, we've been loaning for years now, pretty much since we opened, but um, and we normally loan maybe four or five things a year, but to loan 25 things in a year was, you know, is kind of a whole new level. So that, that's been great. And what, what do you think, you know, the, the Museum Museum is a private museum. Um, do you think that's part of the reason that you can do some of these much bolder juxtapositions, make statements? I mean, do you think you have much more leeway um, as, a result of, as a result of that? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, with the museum being private and being entirely owned by me, I can, you know, pretty much do what I like with it. If I, if I turned it into a foundation, um, in which case you get lots of tax breaks and things, and you can raise money and, you know, that sort of thing, then you also need a board to run it. Um, the collection goes into the foundation, so it's no longer yours, of course. It's owned by the, by the foundation. Um, and then, even as the person that created it, you can't really do anything without board approval. <laughs> so you give your collection away, um, and, uh, and then you sort of, to some degree, lose control of it, which, um, if you've got a giant collection of, of state-wide importance, which, of course, is how many, in fact, most museums have been formed over the last, you know, sort of three or 400 years, um, or you leave it as a legacy, like Sir John Soane did, you know, that's sort of one thing, but, um, but mine's still sort of leave, living and breathing collection and I'm still adding to it and, uh, um, and we change the museum around and change the displays around and sometimes, you know, if I've bought things that are, have ended up in storage and they're, they're not really getting much air time in the museum and, um, uh, and they're not really likely to in the future and it's not really worth putting them in storage for X amount of time, then we've even... Uh, more recently been inclined to even sell a few pieces, particularly as um, the minor ones, I, I would add, but particularly as the years have gone on over the last six years, I've continued to, to add to it, and the museum's just getting a bit stuffed and cluttered now. It, it, was, it was quite busy before, and now it's got really, <laughs> really busy. Uh, so apart from the fact that the public wants to, if they're going to revisit, they want to see something different, um, also you don't you know, you, you want to keep that modern way of displaying things and the pinpoint lighting and everything looking beautiful in order to make just the visitor experience really, really exciting, so. And, and, and I want to open this up to the floor in a minute too, so I'd just give people a chance to ask you questions. So let me end with a question on, on, on modern classicisms. You know, part of our project here is about thinking uh, about how antiquity or ancient art can help us to understand contemporary art, but vice versa, how contemporary art, so contemporary artists, modern 20th century materials, can help us to understand antiquity. And of course you have, or you approach this question from a very different perspective, and, and a practical one, in, in terms of um, getting the viewer and, and the visitor to think about those questions. But what do you think, um, you know, in your view, what do you think we get as thinking about ancient art by looking at it in conjunction with the modern and the contemporary? Um, well, I think art's developed, you know, over the years from, um, you know, when you look at, the, 
art from the Roman or the Greek period, for example. The pieces are really there to define a certain thing, whether it's, whether it's a god or whether it's a person or whether it's something for, I mean, actually, they even brought artworks into, into the many of the, the things they used in the household, actually. I mean, often you'll, you'll, see, you'll see all sorts of household objects that are Roman or Greek, and they have amazing animals and, and designs made into them. I mean, they're really, really extraordinary. In, in some ways, the wealthier people live better than they do today, actually, from, uh, from the art that they sort of, around the sort of regular objects that you have in, have in your home. But, you know, if we project forward sort of into the last sort of 200 years or so, or even actually prior to that, going back to sort of Caravaggio, how, how you start to bring more movement and more life into, into pictures. And when you look at a Caravaggio and you see the gestures of the hands coming forward, it looks like the hands coming out of the painting. And then you move forward into sort of Impressionism and then, and then Modernism. And now we're sort of in, in the contemporary period where uh, it's really about now creating something that, that hasn't been done before and in a way that, that's interesting and, and, uh, and original whether it touches on the classical period, period or not. And that seems to be what really makes a, a great artist and a really globally famous artist in, in the modern era. And you look, you look at Mark's works and for example, and, um, and Mark's done things which have never been done before and will probably, I'm sure, never be done since unless someone copies him, you know, with these figures where, where he's used people with, with, with challenges in, a, in an incredibly interesting art form comparing them to the, to the classical period. I mean, one of the most important pieces of the modern era is, is Mark's um, uh, head that he made out of his... Um, Self. self out of his um, own blood. He donated blood for 10 months and then sculpted a head out of his own blood and is in a fridge. You know, uh, nobody's ever done, had that idea before. Um, if anybody used that again, it's because they're copying Mark, you know. So, so um, and when you look at the Basquiat exhibition, for example, now, whether you like Basquiat or not, Basquiat was a very capable artist. He was a capable artist as a seven-year-old and was winning art prizes in New York age seven against adult competition. He spoke three languages. He was an incredible artist. Whatever you think of Basquiat, nobody had ever painted like Basquiat or produced pictures like him before, and nobody's ever done it since. That makes you know, a great artist in the modern world. So um, I think that, that there's, there's two sort of stories to art really. One's the way that art's developing and the other is the way that art, art, different artists influence each other in different ways and different periods influence each other in different ways. So, you know, what the museum's really about and what, you know, today has really been about is how, um, and we touched on it sort of earlier in a million different, different facets, is that, um, that the beauty and, and the real workmanship that went into, into artworks in the classical period still exists in a way that people still want to emulate it today, today and is still really relevant and really important today. And that's why I, th I think all these kind of exhibitions in, in recent years and days like today are really important to get people, when they go into museums, the general public that is, and not like a, you know, a room like we have today with people are very well versed in, in art for various reasons, to, to look at the ancient world not just as a piece of history but as, as a, a, a period that was absolutely full of artworks wherever you went and uh, more so in many ways than, than even life today. You, you know, incredible pieces of architecture and artwork all over the cities everywhere. So it gets us to sort of challenge historicization rather than just thinking about objects as a piece of social history um, or you know as a piece of even ancient art history actually thinking about them aesthetically in some sense. Yeah I think so I mean maybe that's just my personal experience but, but I didn't go to a particularly good school and went to a regular sort of comprehensive school in Essex and when we have a, when we visited museums and I can remember when I visited them with my parents, which we used to do a lot. You know, we never really visited art museums, but we go and visit museums like the Ashmolean and 
and um, we'd visit museums like the British Museum, the Science Museum, and this kind of thing, but you know, we'd visit sort of castles, cathedrals, um, and you would look at all these places like the history of, of what they were showing. We didn't, it wasn't even really taught that way. You wouldn't walk into the British Museum and see it as a, as a series of artworks as well as a series of historical pieces. If you wanted to go and see an artwork, you'd go to the National Gallery. You know, and, uh, and the two things were almost like two completely different things. Whereas actually the British Museum is not only full of artifacts, it's actually full of artworks. Yeah, yeah. And I think the, the really what's happening now in the last 10 years is, is that people are starting to realize that as, you know, with the public as a whole, I think. Yeah. So you get this rich crossover. I've got my eye on the clock, Chris. Um, I do want to make sure we, we give people a chance to ask questions if they'd like to. Um, would anyone like to ask Chris a question or ask about the museum? Yeah, Sarah. Oh, if you just wait for the microphone. If, um, perfect. Yeah. This is just a very simple question, but um, obviously we can see uh, an array of similar things in a row here at the moment. Do you have any um, kind of thematic curatorial aspirations yourself? Because you've had to presumably employ curators to kind of manage the stuff. Hmm. Do you, um, are you thinking of doing any themed exhibitions or might this conference inspire you to do different kinds of exhibitions to do with your collection? Uh, yeah, no, definitely. In fact, um, we, we do do exhibitions actually and have artists come and, and do exhibitions. We're short on exhibition space, otherwise we'd do them more regularly. But um, for example, Sean Scully did a, um, an exhibition with us about four years ago. And uh, he painted this series of paintings called Doric paintings, which, um, which contain his regular sort of lined work. And um, he was making a sort of play on, on Greek Doric architecture. So, yeah, we're, we have a completely open mind to, um, to artists coming and showing at the museum. He's probably the biggest artist that's kind of had a single show at the museum that's come for, that's approached us that I didn't know, already know personally. I'd never met him before. I said, actually, well, I'd like to do a show at your museum because, you know, actually, I think classical themes as well. And normally, when you look at a Sean Scully picture, you would, you would struggle to make a, a, a classical connection with it. But, uh, but even Sean Scully had had a sort of done a classical series of works, and, and he showed, showed at the museum. Yeah, I mean, maybe we could show just one or two of the other slides as well, where. Um, should we, yeah. Do we have any others in here? This has actually come from a slideshow. Of, is there any others in here with, you've got like the Damien Hirst or? I don't think you've got the Damien Hirst there. You mean the, the new Damien Hirst? No, the, um, there's one of the, the spin painted happy skull that was in the British Museum uh, a few years ago. No, actually, sorry, these are some of the classical artworks. We, we're missing a few that have the, the contemporary pieces as well, but there's, uh, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the pieces that we just showed in the slideshow there, um, yeah, I mean, the Aphrodite cabinet, everything is kind of one theme, but we have a lot of other cabinets in the museum where the juxtaposition is, is not quite so direct. I mean, maybe like the terracotta cabinet. Um, we have another cabinet with two bronze heads that are Roman, one of Apollo and one of Augustus. Um, and in between there, we have a Picasso ceramic with a classical um, uh, picture on it. And uh, we have two Jean Cocteau plates, one of Hermes and uh, one depicting um, Dionysos. Uh, and then we have a, a Damien Hirst spin painted happy head, actually, which was shown in the British Museum in 2009 during the Anthony Gormley, Mark Quinn and Damien Hirst show, show back then, which was Actually, a, also a sort of pioneering ex, sort of exhibition. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got my eye on the time. Uh, there's a lady over on the left somewhere. Has she put her hand down? 
Ah, OK. Uh, Dr. Tav. Christian, we have you to thank not only for just now, but for setting up, working with us on this project, for making today happen. So we owe you an especially large round of applause to say thank you.